everyone. My name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. Today's episode is called 15 UFO Cases That Make You Go, Hmm. By that, I mean these are cases that are just a little bit different, offbeat, sort of what you might call outliers, with unique and really unusual elements. Now, none of these cases involve humanoids. Don't worry, <laughs> they're still super interesting. I know humanoids are probably the most interesting aspect of extraterrestrial contact. These are the closest of UFO encounters. But sightings are also super interesting. And let's face it, the fact is sightings far outnumber cases of direct contact, face-to-face -face meetings with ETs or onboard experiences. In other words, if you're going to have a UFO encounter, it's most likely going to be a sighting. And while they usually don't have as much data, sometimes they do. And sometimes weird things happen that make them super interesting. And those are the kind of cases I've chosen today. Cases that really make you think. Really make you speculate about what is going on here. I've got cases that come from all over the world, 15 cases, that start as early as the 1930s, all the way up to the year 2000. Of course, these are cases that come from all over the world. I love to choose cases that are widely spread geographically. Most of these do occur across the United States, but there are a couple from Africa, more specifically Morocco and Kenya, a couple from Australia, one from Sweden. Most of these cases are quite brief, little sort of interesting news items that were appeared in various newspapers uh, but some were professionally investigated for sure and some are quite extensive a good number of them do involve physical evidence and by that i mean landing traces physiological effects injuries and even a healing uh, of course emotional repercussions a, an encounter can affect a person a person very profoundly, and that's true for sightings. So animal effects as well, um, a wide variety of physical evidence, electromagnetic effects, and so forth. So that's important. A lot of these cases are, of course, multiple witness cases as well. And each case, no matter how brief, I think does have something to offer. It's another piece of the puzzle towards understanding extraterrestrial contact on our planet. So 15 cases is a lot. Again, some are quite brief, some are long, but it's still a lot. So let's just get started. And the first case I'd like to talk about, I call a miniature UFO. This one took place in 1932 in Nambour, Queensland in Australia. It's quite an unusual case, given how early it took place. It does have physiological effects. It also has multiple witnesses. And it's just really unusual. This very early case involves an anonymous young boy who was playing with other children and wandered off to explore a small hill covered with grass. And he heard this low humming noise and decided to go investigate. And I'll just quote the witness directly. As he says, I put both hands up in front of me and parted this tall grass to look through. I heard a low humming sound and saw a round object directly in front of me, about four feet away. It looked the same shape as if two ordinary saucers were placed face to face and then turned on their sides. The color of the object was the same shade of silver gray as a Canberra bomber looks on a dull, rainy, overcast day. The size of the object was about 12 inches in diameter. It hovered 3 inches above the surface of the water. So this is in many ways your typical flying saucer, metallic, only it's a foot wide, very strange, and long before flying saucers were a thing. Now, as this thing hovered just three inches above this little puddle of water, the witness noticed something very strange. There was a disturbance on the water as if this object was putting out, he speculates, some sort of force field 
because it was causing these sort of concentric circles to radiate outwards on the surface of this water. And I'll just let the witness describe what happened next. As he says in his own words, there was a very high-speed shiver motion of the object, as if a gyro stabilizer of some kind were keeping it upright. As I bent forward to look more closely, the humming sound rose suddenly in pitch and volume, and at the same time, a whitish mist began to form between me and the object, but close to it. At the same time, I felt a tight feeling in the head, and as the noise increased, I let go of the tall grass and stepped back. I could not see it any more, and I felt stunned in the head, but I could still hear it humming behind the tall grass. Soon afterwards, everyone decided to go up to the house, and on the way, one girl said suddenly, What was that? Something flew up between those trees. Someone else said, It was a magpie. And the first girl said, No, it was not. I did not see anything, but I knew what it was. It was the object flying off. That night, I noticed large white blisters on both of my hands, and I felt out of sorts. Sometime during the night, whilst I was asleep, most of the blisters burst, and one or two remaining burst during the day, and a clear fluid like water came out. I felt better after that. So it's clear there was some kind of radiation that caused these physiological effects. It's quite an unusual case. I like that case because we got to hear firsthand from the witness who left a quite detailed report of what he saw and how it affected him. And again, it is a multiple witness case, which always raises the level of credibility of the case. It's also a very early report, well before the term UFOs and flying saucers were popularized in our culture. So that alone makes it truly significant. And, again, those physiological effects, that is very interesting. And now we move to our next case, which I call The Faith Healer and the Flying Saucer. Uh, this is a super interesting case, which occurred in mid-1950 in Kenya, Africa. And this was investigated by a researcher, so that's important. But it's a super unusual case where someone received an incredible healing and UFOs were peripherally connected to this very strange event. This very odd case comes from researcher Carl Van Vleerden. He's quite well known. The witness is an anonymous astronomer and actually then the president of East Africa's Astronomical Association and an executive of the East African Railways and Harbors Administration. So a good witness. And when this man's mother suffered a stroke, which left her paralyzed and beyond the help of doctors, he sought out the help of a well-known faith healer from Nairobi, who was also actually an employee of the same company. So this faith healer was very famous and well-known for going into a trance and effectively curing people of various illnesses and conditions. So wanting to help his mother, the astronomer invited the faith healer to his home in Kenya to effect a cure on his mother. The healer went into the mother's room, entered into a trance like he normally does, and began to lay his hands on her to heal her. But while in a trance, he started speaking to the astronomer, and told the astronomer to go outside to his telescope. Now the astronomer had a telescope which he kept in a small outbuilding. And this faith healer told him to go out there and look at a certain section of the night sky. So intrigued, the astronomer obeyed the faith healer's instructions. And looking through the telescope at the designated spot in the sky, he was shocked to see three glowing objects. That shouldn't be there. These were not stars. In fact, they started to move and flew in formation across the sky. This astronomer 
who had no prior belief in UFOs, of course, instantly came to believe in them because he saw them himself. So he returned into his home and was now even more amazed to see that his mother was now sitting up and free of the crippling paralysis that no other doctors had been able to cure. So this was reported on by a reporter, Brian Parks, who worked for the Daily Express. He interviewed the witnesses, hoping to publish a story in the Daily Express, but that newspaper declined to print the story, saying it was, quote, too far out. Thankfully, the story was later published in the Durban, South Africa Tribune. And that's how we came to hear about it here. To me, that's definitely a case that makes you go, hmm, what were those UFOs doing there? Did they know about this healing taking place? How did, did this faith healer know they were there, predict this sighting? There's a lot of unusual elements to it. It's pretty interesting. And now we move to the next case, which I call the UFO at the bus stop. And this is a really unusual case that did receive quite a bit of attention from investigators because there were not only two main witnesses, but a number of other supporting witnesses. These, this object, objects actually, came quite close to the witnesses. And uh, as we shall see, it had some significant implications because this case was right before the idea of people being taken on board a UFO really started to become a thing. And that's what these witnesses felt this UFO was coming to do, take them on board. So that makes this case super important. This very interesting case occurred on May 9, 1956 in Jacksonville, Florida. And it's only pure luck and circumstance that we came to hear about it at all because this case came to the attention of pioneering UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield when the father of one of the witnesses wrote to him about what happened to his daughter. Her name is Joan Frost. Joan had written a letter to her father explaining what happened to her and her girlfriend, whose name was Gertie Wynn, one evening in Jacksonville, Florida. It's quite an interesting account, and I will just let Joan Frost describe what happened in her own words. As Joan says, Something happened to my girlfriend Gertie and me last night that scared me out of ten years of growth. We went to a dance on the outskirts of Jacksonville by bus. We didn't like it there, so we left at 10.15. We were waiting for the bus to go home on this small side street. There was no one around. So per the witnesses, they were waiting at the bus stop on Water Street. And as Joan says, and I quote, We waited until 11 or later, and this is what happened. We looked up and saw two stars moving very high. They were flashing on and off, following each other. They were traveling across the sky at a terrific rate of speed. We thought at first they were falling stars, except they didn't fall, but went out of sight. About 15 minutes later, they came back, and one went up into the other. It came over towards us and dropped lower and lower until it got just over us. I have no idea of what size the object was, as it was very dark and there were no street lights in that area. It was approximately a distance of three telephone poles above us, maybe four. It was round and red and had three lights on it. The thing didn't make a sound, no engine motor or anything. As it came down toward us and while in the sky, it appeared to have three lights on it which were pulsating. However, as it tipped downward and hovered above us, it seemed to be surrounded by an eerie, deep red mist of light. This is why, at first, we thought it was a red-hot falling star, but then realized that even though it was descending at a terrific speed, a star or meteor would drop even faster. So things started to get really strange, because according to the witness, as this object dropped down, they could see it was a solid craft, 
and they saw what looked like a door on the bottom of this thing. As Joan says again in her own words, the door on the bottom appeared to be like a bomb bay, shaped in a long square with only three cracks visible. I started to run down the street, and Gertie just stood there with her mouth wide open. Just then, the bus came and the object rose again. The door on the bottom opened up and the other object came out. We saw the door, but did not take too much notice of its size, because when it looked like we were going to be picked up by the object, I got terrified and started to run down the street, and Gertie just stood there staring up at it. We thought we were goners for sure. Whatever they were, they saw us standing there. The two objects started moving slowly away. There were only a few people on the bus, and they and the driver got out. We all watched the objects go for about 10 minutes. The bus driver said they couldn't be jet planes because of being so low, we would surely have heard the jet engines. We knew they weren't jets. Now, this is all Joan talking, but Gertie also gave an interview and she said, and I quote, the object just went above our heads. There was definitely no sound at all. I sure had a fear of being kidnapped. Now the bus driver, his name was Wallace L. Marlowe. He worked for the Jacksonville Coast Company operating the Lake Shore or number 22 bus. So he pulled up to the bus stop and stepped out and saw these objects. And I'll just let him describe what he saw. As Wallace says, I saw two strange objects in the air just above the girls and ahead of my bus. I pulled on down to where the girls were standing and got out of the bus and looked at the objects myself. They hovered just above us for a second. Then they both went up into the air at a high rate of speed. As I recall, the girls were terribly frightened when they boarded the bus, and I do believe they mentioned something to the effect that they thought they were about to be kidnapped. So, needless to say, this encounter frightened both Joan and Gertie very much. And as Joan says, Gertie and I shook all night long. My girlfriend and I did not notify the police or anyone of this incident. And as far as I know, I do not believe the newspapers recorded the sighting. We didn't say anything to anyone because we are young and felt people would just say we were crazy or making up a nice big story. I did write to my dad though because he knows I am sensible and wouldn't relate anything that wasn't a reality. After our experience, we bought two books on flying saucers and are going to study them. A really amazing case. And it's interesting to me how very nearly we did not hear about this. It's once again a reminder that most cases go unreported and undocumented. So this is something that's much more common than people realize. I also wonder what would have happened if that bus didn't show up when it did. Would these two young ladies have been taken on board? It's entirely possible because that's certainly what they felt was about to happen. A super interesting case on multiple levels. And now we get to another case which is just beyond weird and definitely makes you go, hmm. And I call this one dive bombed by a UFO. Now there are lots of cases of people who have UFO encounters while they're driving, but this one goes a bit more than just a UFO car encounter. It does involve four witnesses it does involve some minor physiological effects as well. And it's not just one sighting, but two, which seem to be intrinsically connected. And it got quite a bit of attention from researchers. This case occurred over a period of two days, well, nights actually, June 24 through 25, 1957, in Russellville, Indiana. It was around 11 p.m., on a Monday, June 24, four teenagers from Greencastle, Indiana, including Jerry Bretain, George Bennett, 
both age 17, and their friends Bob Coleman and Jackie Glover, both age 18, were traveling along by car on Highway 234, not far from Russellville. So, they were actually traveling from Russellville to Greencastle when a glowing object with colored lights swooped down over their car and went off. So it was a brief sighting, but it wasn't until the next night, June 25, at the same location and the same time, that they had a much closer encounter with what's apparently the same UFO. They had parked their car a few miles east of Russellville, again along the same highway, when they saw a huge red light in the sky. Without warning, it suddenly dropped down over the car and hovered very low, about 200 feet overhead. And as Jackie Glover says in his own words, it wasn't shaped like anything we had ever seen. It appeared to be around 50 by 100 feet in size, equipped with large white lights on each side. Several other colored lights also were visible. We were flabbergasted at the monstrosity as it hung in the sky over our car. So curious, the boys decided to flash a spotlight on the object. And immediately after flashing the spotlight on and off the, towards the UFO, it zoomed lower over the car. And this really frightened the young men. They took off in their car. And to their shock, this object followed them. And then suddenly it did something very strange. It sent down a smaller lighted object, which actually zoomed right down, entered into the car through an open window, and landed at Jerry's feet, bounced up and exploded against Jackie's cheek. It created a brilliant flash of light. There was a sharp explosive sound, reminding them much of a firecracker. Thankfully, nobody was injured. Later, they did find bits of yellow and purple paper in the car. Could this have been a firecracker? They don't know. There was no one in the area that they saw, but it frightened them all. In fact, Jackie said it frightened him so bad, he cried. So, and, you know, mind you, he's 18 years old. So at this point, the object took off, and as Jackie says in his own words, it shot upward at great speed and then moved north like a bolt of lightning. The boys continued to speed away. They were still a bit shook up. And moments later, they hit this bump in the road and heard two weird clicking noises, which they believed sounded like the hubcaps coming off the front wheels of their car. So they stopped, backed up to this bump, and got out. And sure enough, looking at the wheels, the hubcaps had fallen off, but were now both missing. And they did a quick search, but failed to locate them. And it being still dark and then being frightened, they continued onward. But they did return to the spot the next day to search for the missing hubcaps, but never did find them. They were apparently gone. Really strange. The boys wondered if perhaps the magnetic attraction of the UFO had literally sucked them off the car. <laughs> Hard to say for sure, but they did notify the police and Putnam County Sheriff Joe Rowlings said that his office had actually received several reports from residents who had seen, quote, saucers, apparently in this area at that time, and they provided the same description as given by these four young men. And this officer also issued a warning advising young people to refrain from saucer hunting at the location of this sighting. That case is interesting to me because I've never heard of anything quite like it. And it's also interesting to me that the police became involved and actually issued a warning to people uh, not to go looking for UFOs. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just interesting in a number of different ways. And now we move to another case, which also involves a person in a vehicle. I call this one a UFO car chase. And yeah, there are lots of cases of UFOs chasing cars. But what happened in this case, I've never heard before. It's got an, an unusual element to it. In some ways it's fairly typical, but in others it's not. 
I think it's an important case. It was researched by an investigator, so that's important. It occurred on March 13, 1967 in Sandefuca, Washington. And I really feel for the witness in this case. This bizarre case occurred at 8.15 p.m., again on March 13, 1967, Cecil Perkins was in his home in San Defuca when someone knocked on his door. He opened the door, and there, standing in front of him, was a very distraught, frightened young man. And he was pale, trembling, and he had quite an incredible story to tell. He told Cecil that he had been driving in this area with his girlfriend when an object, quote, radiating a bright orange light, came upon his car hovered over it and kept pace with it while he drove down the highway. And no matter what speed he went, this object remained overhead. So he became frightened and sped up and slowed down and could not shake this car or this UFO. And finally he came screeching into Cecil Perkins' driveway, ran to the door and informed Cecil of this UFO, which by the way was still hovering overhead. Now, unknown to this anonymous man, this driver, while the UFO was following his car, there was another gentleman, Bert James, who was driving on the same highway when he saw this man and woman who were being chased in their car by the UFO. And as Bert James says in his own words, the car came up behind us at high speed and passed us. There was an intense light and we thought it was a spotlight or the light from a police car. The girl in the passing auto had her hands over her eyes and we could hear her screaming. We were concerned and we were going to give pursuit if she needed help. So they didn't fully understand what was going on and Bert, who was driving, had two other people in the car with him. And they followed a short distance, at which point the man pulled into Cecil Perkins' driveway. And this is when Bert and his companions saw the UFO hovering overhead. And at the same time, something very strange happened. Bert's own car stopped of its own accord. The engine motor died, and the headlights went out. And as Bert says in his own words, it was as if someone, something, had turned off the engine. There was no power. We couldn't get the car started. It was then that we noticed this flying object. For a moment or two, we could see it hovering on the brow of a hill, behind the trees, and then it would disappear. It was sort of like it was playing peekaboo, as if it was watching us. The object finally disappeared, but Bert had had enough. He and his friends decided unanimously to depart the scene and head for the protection of their home. Now later, investigators, of course, did find out about the case, interviewed Cecil Perkins and Bert James. The first driver, unfortunately, was never located, but researchers did learn that there were several other sightings of what was apparently the same object in the same area on that same night. So quite a few people apparently saw this. But what I like about that case, and what really made me go, hmm, is the fact that this UFO was chasing this car so low over it for such a long period of time and other cars actually, people in other cars actually saw this happening. Uh, I mean, can you imagine being chased by a UFO and passing other cars and still this UFO is chasing you down a highway and apparently ignoring the other cars? It's really unusual. I don't know of a whole lot of UFO car chases quite like that. So that, I think, alone makes this case super interesting. And now we get to the case that really made me go, hmm. And I think that of all the cases in this collection, this is probably one of my favorite. It's so unusual. I call this one the UFO that talked back. And this occurred on November 15, 1967 in Uricoin, Australia, and it's a very unusual case of a UFO landing right next to a person, and what happened when it landed <laughs> is just off the charts bizarre, and I think will definitely make you wonder about what is going on here.
It was a cloudy, windy, rainy day in Uricoin, and it was around 6.30 p.m. when farm manager Alan Poole had just finished rounding up the sheep and was getting ready to go home. He climbed into his Land Rover and started to drive, but he was only about a mile away from the farm where he worked when he heard this very loud humming noise, which he said was very much like an electric motor. At first, he wondered if his engine was breaking down, but then he looked up and he saw a strange craft about a half mile away, but quite low in the sky, only about 400 feet up in the air. And to his great alarm, it appeared to be coming straight towards him. And as Alan says in his own words, I thought it was an aeroplane, but it kept on coming towards me and suddenly landed beside my rover, nearly against the door, say about four feet away. I wondered what was happening. I was completely perplexed. The whining noise was very loud and frightening. So Alan described this object as a gray metallic saucer about 12 feet wide, six feet high, with no markings on it. As he says, Quote, it was flat on the bottom and dome-shaped on top, just like an upturned saucer. All I could see was this saucer with four visible windows, two round and two square, but I was unable to see into them. It appeared to be made of a metal which was smoky gray in color. There were no lights on it, but there were portholes like windows around it, and there seemed to be a cabin in front. I didn't know what to do. I partly opened the door to get out and said aloud to myself, To hell with you, sport! To my astonishment, the words echoed back to me. I'm sure it was my own voice, but this could not have been an echo, for there was a strong wind blowing away, and it would be impossible to produce an echo in that position. Alan's car was running normally though Alan's wife did report that at that time of the encounter, her own TV started acting up. Oh, so she was not far away. Anyway, this craft was there for only a short moment, about 10 seconds, and then quickly flew away. As Alan says in his own words, as I put one leg out of my car, the object suddenly took off vertically. I was so frightened that I thought I was going mad. I sat back in the seat, and trying to relax, I rolled myself a cigarette. I soon got out of the car to have a look at the ground for signs of where the thing had been. The object was already out of sight, although I could still hear the humming noise. Now there were no marks on the ground. Alan left the area and at first decided to keep quiet about his encounter, but later called the police but he's convinced he saw something very unusual. As Alan says in his own words, this thing was not of this earth. I'm not offering any theories about it. All I know is that it was unlike anything we know on this earth. Now, Alan's employer at the farm, his name is D.V. Waters, said that if Alan, that Alan had worked at the farm for 10 years and was very reliable, and he said, if Alan says he saw a flying saucer, you can take it from me that there was one there. So a super close encounter. Very strange. And two days after this incident, there were two other sightings less than 100 miles from Uricoin. So one encounter is rare, rarely a one-off. Usually there's quite a bit of activity going on. And that seems to be true in this case. I think you'll agree that's a truly strange case. And the fact that there were other sightings in that area at that time always lends credibility to it. It's clear the witness was quite shook up by what happened. And I really wonder about it. What, why would the UFO just repeat what the man is saying? It's very bizarre. <laughs> so, there's always another case that's so amazing about this field of study. There, you might be skeptical of one case or another, but there are hundreds upon hundreds to 
you know, back up what one case is reporting. So if you dismiss one case, there's always another to take its place. And here is another case which I find fascinating. It is super brief. I don't believe it was professionally investigated. This was just a little brief news story that appeared in the newspapers. But it's quite unusual because we often hear about UFOs sending down beams of light or causing burns or something along those lines. But this appears to be the opposite of that. And I call this one Firefighting Aliens. And this incident occurred on June 21st, 1968 in Morocco. In June of 1968, southern Morocco was suffering a tremendous heat wave that was causing a rash of wildfires in the area, more than 16 of them. Now, one gentleman wrote to the newspaper about all of this. His name is Mifta, and he wrote to the Moroccan newspaper Le Petit Marocain, and he said, and I quote, we learned that one of these fires, the cause of which not, has not yet been established, one in a field of wheat, 14 hectares in area, belonging to C. Aves Meznui of the Meznui group of the southern Ulan Buzerera clan. It is reported that a luminous object resembling a shooting star suddenly landed in the field of wheat and rapidly extinguished the fire flying off again afterwards. The luminous object was circular. So again, a very brief case, but researchers found out about this and speculated that perhaps the electromagnetic fields surrounding this object extinguished the fire. So this could have been an accidental byproduct or perhaps intentional. Hard to say, but it's certainly a very odd effect from a UFO. So that's a case you can make up your own mind about it. I thought it was worth reporting because it is so unusual. I'm going to have to look into it to see if I can find other cases like it, but as far as I know, it's unique. So that, I think, makes this case significant. And here is another case, which is not wholly unique, but I can't say I've ever heard one quite like it. I call this one UFO sets man's hair on fire. And yeah, as the title implies, this is quite a strange encounter, which occurred on July 20th, 1968, one month after the above case. This one occur occurred in Norland, Sweden. It's a very brief account that I don't believe was professionally investigated, though it was reported on by a researcher who found the account in a newspaper. And it's a pretty interesting case of a very close-up sighting, which we would probably label as a close encounter of the second kind, given that it did affect the environment, in this case, the gentleman who was the witness. It was around 1 p.m., again on July 20th, as Norland resident Anders Stenland was in his front yard and saw a UFO coming from the west directly towards him. And it was pretty big. He said it was about 23 feet wide, blue-black in color, and looked like two saucepan lids placed end-to-end. -end. So very much your typical flying saucer. He said it looked like it was surrounded by this bluish smoke. And as it came zooming towards him, it was suddenly only 100 feet above him. And he felt like it was coming to target him specifically. And as it did, he threw himself to the ground to protect himself. And he said that as it came over his head, he smelled something burning and felt heat at his temples. And it was then that he noticed his hair had been burned. Very quickly, the saucer curved off to the east and left the area. Now, Anders called the police but they were unable to locate any other witnesses. So there was really no other way to verify this other than the fact that Anders' hair had been burned by this UFO. It's very odd. What a weird case that was. I, again, feel for the witness in that case. That must have been very, 
very scary. And now we move to the next case, which I call Morse code UFO. There are lots of cases with very weird effects from UFOs, and this is certainly one of them. And what makes this one so interesting that these effects were occurring over a widespread area and are some of the most unusual, what we would call electromagnetic effects that I think I've heard in a long time. A super interesting case which occurred on June 18, 1971 over Ben Lomond in California, but actually the surrounding areas as well. It was just about 1 a.m., very late at night or early in the morning, depending on how you look at it, when Josephine Clark and Minna Thompson, both who lived at 7900 Harvard Drive in Ben Lomond, noticed something very strange. All the electric lights in the house and the TVs were dimming in and out in an irregular pattern that reminded them of Morse code. So as this went on, they decided to wake up their husbands, Leonard Clark and Tom Thompson, to try and figure out what was going on. And that's when they looked outside and saw that the television antenna and the power lines across the street were snapping and buzzing. And get this, this was in sync with the weird pulsations going on with the electrical activity in their own home. And now, looking to the city lights of Scotts Valley and Felton and Boulder Creek, not to mention Ben Lomond, they saw that the city lights all around them were doing the same thing, pulsating in this weird rhythm. So Tom grabbed an AC voltmeter and he saw that the voltage was actually fluctuating from 5 to 8 volts between 113 and 115 volts. And he could also smell ozone, which is a product of electrical fields. So they couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, Tom Thompson walked to the end of the deck. And this is when he saw this huge UFO, an enormous orange glowing sphere hovering very low, directly between two trees. And he could see immediately that this was not anything normal. As Tom says in his own words, it seemed to sparkle, scintillate, or twinkle steadily, all sparkling like a fish eye. The edges of the disk were very round, like a hoop. It looked bigger than the full moon. So he watched it for about 30 seconds when suddenly it disappeared. And it was just a short time later, at about 1.55 a.m., that a power failure struck Ben Lomond and, of course, Scotts Valley, Felton, and Boulder Creek, too. It affected at least 10,000 people. So this looks like a classic case of a UFO-caused blackout. But it's so odd that it was affecting their own electricity in their home in this weird pulsating sort of Morse code manner. So was it trying to send a message? I don't know if I would go that far, but it's certainly very odd. So there you go, a super interesting case. Lots of cases where UFOs affect electronics in a wide variety of ways. But this one is definitely a little offbeat. It does appear to be a power failure connected to this sighting. So that is not terribly unusual. There are a lot of cases like that, but I can't say I've heard one quite like this, but it has four witnesses, four direct witnesses, very close up sighting. So a super interesting case. And now we move to the next case I'd like to cover, which I call the UFO and the freezer. Talk about unusual electromagnetic effects. Well, I'll just dive right into this case and you can make up your own mind about it. But as we shall see, while this might sound like a unique case, I found another very, very similar to it. A couple, actually, which I'll report on right now. But this case occurred on December 5, 1973 at La Selva Beach in California. So it was two years later, and only 23 miles away from the above Morse code case, 
that another very similar and equally thought-provoking incident occurred began in mid-November 1973 when a family in La Selva Beach watched a UFO move over their home and off into the distance. And unknown to them, another witness in the area was also seeing UFOs. They actually called the police, and they showed up and also observed the UFO. But it's what happened two weeks later on December, December 5th, 1973, that really had this one family shaking their heads in puzzlement. It was sometime in the middle of the night that the son of the family woke up to hear an alarm going off downstairs. And going to investigate, he saw that the family's freezer alarm had been triggered. This alarm goes off when the temperature in the freezer gets too high. So the son's mother also woke up, and apparently the freezer was fine. But when they went outside, they saw a UFO. And it was just like the one they had seen two weeks earlier moving overhead. And it was blinking in exact rhythm with the freezer alarm. As the sun says, it went across the sky and then came again. It was real strange. So as this alarm was continuing to go off in the same rhythm as this blinking UFO and not going away, they finally called the police, who actually came to the house. They verified both the UFO and the freezer alarm and saw that they were going off at the same time. Finally, this craft moved off and presumably the freezer did return to normal, but it's one of these countless cases involving electromagnetic effects. So this one is admittedly very strange. And here's another case which is only peripherally related, if at all, but certainly is strange. This next one occurred in Webster, Massachusetts on February 26, 1967, and a wave of sightings struck this area. And at the time, this gentleman was indoors and didn't see anything but he says that he did notice the lights and the electrical appliances in his home went off for a few moments. But when he later returned to the kitchen and opened the refrigerator, he says all his food was frozen solid. And he connects this to the UFO sighting. And what makes this super interesting is reportedly another family in Massachusetts, this time in Woodstock, reported the same thing. A UFO passing over their house and the next morning, the contents of their refrigerator were frozen solid. Weird electromagnetic effects, for sure. So a case like that would be easy to dismiss if there weren't more than one case like it. So I don't know quite what to make of it. It's really unusual. But as we have seen, UFOs do have the ability to electromagnetically affect all kinds of our machines. So perhaps that's what's going on here. I don't think it was a coincidence. Hard to say for sure. But given that there are more than one case like this, well, there you go. I don't know. That's why I titled this episode UFO Cases That Make You Go, Hmm, because they're quite strange. And now we move on to the next case, which I call Harassed by a UFO. And this is a super unusual case for a number of reasons. The, the main witnesses are a young family of four people, a husband, a wife, and their two young daughters. But it's quite a complicated case because it occurred over apparently a period of two days and involves not just those four witnesses, but over 30 other witnesses and another encounter that could very well be connected, given that it occurred in the same area at the same time. This one occurred on June 18 and 19 in 1972, in sort of the Barstow, Victorville area of Southern California. And as we shall see, it's a tremendous case. This complicated and very bizarre case occurred somewhere on a dirt road not far from Barstow, California, the Victorville area, and it does involve a large number of witnesses. Mostly one family, 
a family consisting of a husband and wife and two girls, age nine and eleven, were camping in the Barstow area. This was on June 18, 1972, when a UFO appeared overhead. They said it made this very loud whirring sound, so loud it actually hurt their ears. They said it came swooping down, quote, almost on top of us. And it at this time appeared to be a, quote, big, round, orange-colored thing. But then it would dart up in literally one second, at which time it took on a different appearance of, quote, just a big, bright blue dot high in the sky. But then it would drop down again, always emitting this high-pitched, painful whirring sound, and then dart up again. And this went on for three hours, until it finally left. As a result of this encounter, the younger girl, the nine-year-old child, she became physically ill, apparently from the trauma of all this. They reported the encounter to the police the next day, and were told that they must have been imagining things. So they left the campsite, and it was the next evening, around 11.30 p.m., and this same family was driving their pickup camper and trailer between Barstow and Victorville when this same UFO appeared, this time swooping very low over the road. And in fact, the nine-year-old girl was so frightened by its appearance that she grabbed the steering wheel, which caused the father to lose control of his vehicle and drive off the road into a ditch in the, in the sand and rocks and quickly became stuck. Now, meanwhile, this UFO dropped down and began to swoop very low over them and then dart back up into the sky, performing these same maneuvers that it had done the previous night. So this poor family was stuck, stranded on the side of the road, and struggled unsuccessfully to get their vehicle back on the road when other people driving by stopped to help. Among them were a brother and sister from Inglewood. They stopped to help and the family explained about this UFO. And the siblings, this brother and sister, were skeptical at first until of course this UFO returned and they saw it themselves. It came swooping down very low, making this weird whirring sound and then darting back up into the sky. And it wasn't long before other cars began to stop. And finally, Daryl Totten and his two friends stopped. And there were now about 30 people there. Many cars pulled over. And most of these people were much more interested in watching this UFO performing its strange antics than in helping the family. And Daryl Totten saw it. And he said that this quote, strange, circular, whatever it was, was moving quickly about in the sky above us, changing from bluish-white in color at higher altitude, then to a weird orange-yellow as it came down. So everyone there was talking about what was happening. Daryl talked to several of the people there, including Air Force personnel, some who speculated that the object might be secret military craft, others who disagreed, saying that they would know about it, but all of them were absolutely mystified by this object. And Daryl approached the two young girls who were part of this family and spoke to them directly. As Daryl says, The still frightened girls told me their story between the several dips this craft made over us while several strong men moved boulders and pushed the camper and trailer out of the ditch. Each time, the thing seemed to move in on us as though exploring the various automobile lights and flashlights trained on the repair job. The two little girls would cover their ears and throw themselves at their mother's feet, sobbing, while I tried to assure both the mother and the girls that there was bound to be a logical explanation somewhere. Darrell, however, had to admit that he had no explanation. He had never actually believed in UFOs, but if he says that he was shook up when he saw this object swoop very low near them, close enough that he could hear this whirring, which he said sounded like a vacuum cleaner. And both he and the sister from Inglewood attempted to photograph this object. They had cameras, 
though apparently these photos never came out. They were certainly never publicly released. But finally, those who had stopped to help did get this truck and camper back on the road, at which point the object left and everyone slowly dispersed, continuing on their interrupted journey. And this whole incident would probably have never become known at all if not for another encounter which occurred at that same night, very nearby, when two airmen from George Air Force Base, their names were Randolph Wojoman and Gary Corley, they said that around 1 a.m., shortly after the above encounter, they saw a 375-foot diameter bright orange orb. So this is the same description that the other people were giving. Could very well be the same object. But they watched this thing descend behind a building at George Air Force Base, where they had been assigned as security police. Now doing their job, the officers reported it to the Air Police and to the Victorville, Victorville and Adelanto Police, who apparently alerted UFO researchers and the newspapers as this account appeared in the newspapers. And this was how Daryl Totten heard about this sighting. And he realized that the UFO he and the others had seen occurred on the same night, very near to this same location. So apparently connected. So while the first part of that case wasn't professionally investigated, unfortunately, the second part involving the two servicemen did receive an enormous amount of attention from researchers and was widely reported. But at the time, no one knew it was connected to the first part of this case. And as the report says, the first part of this case only came to light when the account of the two servicemen was published in newspapers. So again, makes you wonder, could there be other people having encounters in that area at that time who never went public? Uh, just that one witness went forward to newspapers and there were 30 people there. So I think that's a pretty clear indication, once again, that most people do not report their encounters in any official capacity, which is so unfortunate because we're losing so much data because of this whole UFO cover-up has been very effective in that regard. Thankfully, it is failing, it is crumbling, truth is coming out fast, and it's a new era, for I think, for all humanity, as we are coming to recognize that we are absolutely not alone, and the evidence for UFOs is undeniable. And that moves us along to our next very unusual case, which I call what the UFO did to the gas station. So this is a very bizarre case, which was professionally researched, which does involve a lot of witnesses, which does involve some really unusual effects that I am really not even sure how to categorize, except perhaps as electromagnetic effects or landing traces. Well, I'll let you make up your own mind about it once we get the facts out on this case, which occurred on July 31st, 1976, over a gas station in Council Bluffs, Iowa. So many witnesses in this case. Uh, well, let's just get right to it. It was around 11.30 p.m., again on July 31st, 1976, and Debbie Falken was returning home from work. She was driving by the Eldon's Standard Service Station, located at 2710 South 24th Street in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and she saw this oblong object with bright windows hovering about 100 feet above the gas station. Now, she thought at first that it might be a helicopter, but pulling off the road to get a better look, she could see that it had no tail, no props, she heard no sound, and in fact, she watched as other cars also pulled over to look at this strange object. So she realized this was a UFO, not a conventional aircraft. She was completely amazed and decided to rush home to alert her brother-in-law, Roger Davids. And together they returned to the gas station, but unfortunately by then 
the object was gone. It had apparently left, it had apparently just left, as the other cars who had pulled over earlier were still there. But, unfortunately, fearing ridicule and disbelief, Debbie at first told nobody about this sighting, until she and her brother-in-law learned that this gas station had suffered extensive and unexplained damage. And as it turned out, a CB radio, a burglar alarm, and an adding machine were reportedly, quote, damaged beyond repair. Also, a vending machine malfunctioned and spilled change all over the floor. Now, the gas station owner, Eldon Bird, believed that this was caused by lightning, and this is what he told the insurance agent. However, this might have been just an excuse, because obviously if you're going to call reporting a UFO did this damage, you're not going to be believed. And in fact, according to the National Weather Service, there were no storms in Council Bluffs on that night. And also, according to the researchers who investigated this case, they know three other witnesses who were near the gas station on that night, and they reported that there was no rain, no thunder, or lightning. Furthermore, the technician who was called to examine the damaged equipment said that the damage was actually internal, and the electrical cords themselves showed no damage, which lightning would have done. So the gas station owner, Eldon Bird, says he did talk to several customers who said that they also saw the UFO. But he told investigators that he said nothing for fear that people would, quote, think they were crazy. So many witnesses were interviewed by researchers, including residents Mrs. E.R. Stanfill and others, all who confirmed that this weird craft hovered just 100 feet over the station itself, apparently at the same time this damage occurred. Now, station attendants Mark Holt and Dan Stone did say that this was caused by lightning strike and they made no report of any UFOs. So there's some controversy about what's going on here. Is this lightning just an excuse? Did a UFO actually do this? In any event, it's quite unusual. So clearly there is some controversy surrounding that case and whether the damage to the gas station was caused by lightning strike or what. Uh, so hard to say for sure, uh, but it's super interesting that this UFO was hovering directly over this gas station when it suffered so much damage. It's really odd. Definitely makes you go, hmm. <laughs> and now we move to the next case, which to me is one of the most poignant in this little collection. I call this one Susie's Puppies and the UFO. And I wanted to include this case because this is a very profound example of animal reactions caused by the presence of a UFO. And this one occurred on February 4, 1978 in Orange, California. This was investigated by researchers. It was reported in the newspaper as well. Uh, it was widely viewed in terms of there being multiple witnesses. It's not just the primary witnesses, but the neighbors also saw activity. So it's an unusual case, especially when you consider what happened to this dog, Susie, and her puppies. Again, there are many hundreds of cases in which animals react strangely to the presence of a UFO. But researcher Idabel Epperson writes, Can anyone top this for animal reactions? It was around 3.30 a.m. when Claire Samaza, her 14-year-old daughter Donna, and her 11-year-old son Eric were woken up by a weird humming sound coming from outside their home. It quickly got louder and louder until it began to hurt their ears. And at this point, their dog Susie also apparently heard it. Now their dog Susie had just given birth to a litter of puppies only two days earlier. And when this weird buzzing sound, this humming sound, started to appear, Susie began to whine and whimper. And then she began to bark and howl, whatever this was, it was driving poor Susie crazy. 
and as Claire Samaza says, I can't explain it. It was an extremely loud humming, like a mob of people were humming. And all of a sudden, our dog Susie began to set up a howl. I was kind of afraid to look out the window. But she and her two children did look out the window and were shocked to see this strange oval craft hovering overhead, not far above the trees, just a few thousand feet away from them. And as Claire says, it looked like a flat, round dish and was surrounded by a gray cloud of smoke. They said it had a bright red light at each end and it was sending shafts of light towards the ground. They also saw several blue-white lights in a horizontal pattern between the two red lights. So later they did find out that their neighbor, Dorothy Pascal, had also been awakened by this humming noise. And this object, it stayed there for a long time, about 30 minutes, during which time Susie's anguished howls and whimpering continued. And every now and then, Susie would stop barking and stare at the wall with this weird expression that left all the Samazas deeply puzzled. And even stranger was what happened next. Susie had seven puppies. They were all snuggled up in a box on the ground floor at the time this UFO appeared. And Susie apparently felt that danger threatened her little pups because she picked one up by biting the scruff of its neck and carried it upstairs. And with the pup in her mouth, she wandered from room to room trying to find a safe place for her little pup. And none of these locations seemed to satisfy her. She tried hiding her puppy under the bed, but she didn't like that. And finally she took her pup out from under the bed and hid it behind the drapes. And this was apparently the best spot she could find because next she ran downstairs and carried the other six puppies one by one back upstairs and secreted them behind the drapes, hid them. After about a half hour, the object finally left, and as Claire Samaza says, there was a reddish glow in the sky around it that lasted for a while after it disappeared. The Samazas actually called the Orange Police Department, who referred them to UFO researcher Dr. Elvin Lawson. And as he found out later, it turned out that just a few hours after this encounter, there was another sighting not far away from this area. A very strange case. Again, there are lots of cases where animals react in unusual ways in the presence of a UFO. It's very clear that Susie, the dog, was aware that there was a craft out there and was just taking steps to protect her puppies. Um, it's just a super fascinating case. And again, good evidence that animals can sense things that we are not always aware of. And here is another super fascinating case, which is quite brief and wasn't professionally investigated by researchers, but definitely caught the attention of researchers. It could have turned out to be a huge case, but just didn't get that far. I call this one a washed up UFO. This occurred on May 29, 1981 at Yakina Bay. This is along the coast of Newport, Oregon. And it's a very unusual case of what looks like a grounded UFO. It was around 2.30 a.m. again on May 29, 1981, when an unnamed gentleman was walking along the beach. This is just north of the North Yakina Bay jetty, when he came upon an object that had apparently washed up on the beach. That was his impression. This was on, of course, Yakina Beach. And this object was about 20 feet wide, six feet long, and was made of a strange material. Uh, he could not identify it. The witness walked up to this object and kicked it. And boy, was he surprised to see that this object actually began to glow when he kicked it. And this is when he realized it was very unusual. And he called the police. Now, Police Chief Spencer 
took the call and he dispatched two officers to the scene. They found the object, but were unable to identify it. They walked around it. They said it was not glowing, but they were unable to determine what this object was made from. Didn't look like it was metal or wood or what. They just weren't sure but they decided that they were going to wait till morning to conduct a full investigation, and they left the scene. And when they returned to the area in daylight, this object was now gone. So they don't know if it was scooped up, flew away, or washed out to sea, or what. They did contact the Oregon State University Marine Science Center in Newport to assist in their investigation Unfortunately, the story pretty much ends there, and this weird mystery object remains unidentified. It's so unfortunate that that case didn't go any farther. It's quite likely that this craft, whatever it was, perhaps took off. Maybe it was recovered by military. We just don't know. But the fact that the police verified this incident makes this significant. It's not just resting on one person's anecdotal account. Clearly not a piece of wreckage, given that this thing glowed. It's, you know, there aren't pontoons or anything that just glow when you kick them. So this was clearly an unusual object. And given that the police weren't even able to identify what it was composed of, is also, I think, significant. So an unusual case. And now we move to the last case of this bunch, which is very brief, but kind of interesting. <laughs> Definitely makes you go, hmm. And I call this one the Alien Alibi. And this is just a very brief news clipping, but I think it's important. It occurred in the year 2000 in Des, Mo Des Moines, Iowa. And I'll just get to it and you can make up your own minds about it. There are very few details in this case, but according to the Des Moines, Iowa police, they arrested a 37-year-old man for trespassing in a stranger's house. This man denied the charges of burglary and trespassing. He declared his innocence and said that he was actually 170 miles away from the location when he was picked up by a UFO and then returned into the stranger's house. Now, this stranger's house happens to be about one mile from this man's actual home. Now, the police were skeptical. They said they don't believe this man, but they will reconsider his story if the ETs show up at the station to support his, quote, alien alibi. As of yet, of course, this did, has not happened, <laughs> but uh, this is not the only case of this kind to be reported. So yeah, a very brief case, but it makes you wonder, because why would someone come up with that excuse to say why they're in someone's house, uh, breaking in? Because who's going to believe that? Like, oh yeah, a UFO dropped me off in someone's house. Any other excuse would make a lot more sense. And I think that adds a level of credibility to this gentleman's account. And I can say that I know of several other cases like this where people have been dropped off in the wrong location inside a person's home, and in a few cases with the doors locked. So it's not a unique case in that regard. So perhaps this gentleman's reason for appearing in that house is 100% true. Fortunately, we don't know because it wasn't professionally investigated but still I think is super interesting and makes you go, hmm, like was that done on purpose or not? It's very strange. So that's the show for today. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope these cases made you think a little bit and wonder about the whole UFO phenomena. And yeah, just sightings, but I think you'll agree some of these sightings are super interesting and while it's much more interesting, I think, personally, to talk about humanoids and onboard encounters and this sort of thing, we can't forget that sightings are a big part of the UFO phenomena. A lot of people have sightings. It's something somewhere near 10 to 20% of the population 
claim to have had a sighting. I think it's probably a little higher than that. Hard to say for sure. But again, a big part of this phenomena. And again, these cases go way, way back in time, far earlier than how I'm reporting here. Uh, but again, are occurring all over the world, all kinds of witnesses, all kinds of evidence supporting these cases, and more evidence that we are not alone. So, that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching. It's always appreciated. And until next time, keep asking questions. Keep searching for the truth. Most important of all, keep having fun. Until next time, bye.